Well, one of my biggest concerns is with President Trump flying in tomorrow, can we get off on time? So we'll see what that does for our travel time. But uh, we're excited to be heading to Wichita to play a really good Houston team. I've had a chance to watch three full games now. And the interesting thing, they played McNeese, who we played early in the season. So I watched them against McNeese. So it's kind of full circle. I watched them within the first week of the season and watch them again now. And they're the same team. They're extremely physical. They double in the post. They've got really strong guards that can shoot it and drive it. And uh, they defend at a high level. They reflect their head coach, Calvin Sampson, who's a longtime head coach, Washington State, Indiana, Houston Rocket assistant, and now with the University of Houston. And got great respect for him and what he's done with that program. So we're excited for our opportunity. Obviously, everyone knows we're playing well right now, and uh, it's a one-and-done situation. It's the best time of the year, and we're excited to play. I know you're not a, a rookie head coach, but you've done this before, but as a, as a, I guess, rookie head coach, as your first year as the official coach, going against a guy who's had so much experience in the NCAA tournament as a head coach, I, what, what are some of the things that you, I guess, look for in that? You know, I, I feel like even though it's my first time as a head coach in the NCAA tournament, I've been fortunate enough to go multiple times. Obviously, you know, be with Steve Fisher and to win the national championship and play for two other national titles. You know, I know what it's about. I know how exciting it is. And now I get to step out there for my first time. And I remember when Steve took over for the first time for Bill Frieder when we were playing North Carolina. And I just said to him at the time, do you ever think you would be sitting here coaching against Dean Smith? in your first tournament. And so this is my first tournament and I'm excited to go against a great coach in Calvin Sampson and I take great comfort that I have a really good team uh, to do it with. So hopefully they will make a first time head coach look good. Who, who can you compare Houston to? I mean, now that you've seen them a little bit, the team that you've played, the teams you played? Yeah, they're just, you know, they play with a physicality that we haven't played against for a while. I mean, obviously, everybody has a degree of physicality, but they seem to have that next level. You know, they, they pound you inside. Uh, they bump cutters. You know, they restrict your movement. It's hard. Uh, when it does go into the low post, they bring the opposite big over to double, like we do. So that won't be something new we haven't seen. Uh, you know, they play a lot of the defensive schemes we've seen, but they do it with a physicality that we haven't seen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, my staff is, they're big into the metrics, the Ken Palm, and they rank extremely high both offensively and defensively in that statistical package. And so those are numbers that hopefully uh, we can stretch the other way, you know, because their defensive and offensive numbers are extremely high in that rating. And uh, it will be a great challenge for us to A, score on them, and B, stop them. You say they're physical, so is that play at all I guess you know since you said you hadn't played really a physical team like that for a while it doesn't cha change the way we've played we just have to say that there's going to be more contact and uh and not look to the refs to correct it but to play through it you know so we'll have to play through some of that and it's hard to emulate but uh you know it's just you can't look to officiating to help you win a game we have to uh adjust to the way the game's playing and and, uh, and uh, find a way to fight our, ourselves through some of that. Seth, there's really no book or roadmap on how to prepare for a team that you haven't seen in this short time. What's the toughest part of all of that, getting ready for this? You know, it's, you look at them on tape, and I remember back when we went to the NCAA tournament with Randy Holcomb and Al Fox and that crew, and you watch Illinois on tape, you say, wow, they, you know, I think we can maybe take advantage of this and that. And then you walk out there and they're like four inches taller than you at every position. You say, wow, I didn't realize they were that big. So Houston on tape, they're not extremely tall. You know, they don't, when you look at their roster, but you look how thick they are. And so there's one thing to watch tape and prepare and another when you step out there and encounter it. So there's always that, uh, that oh, wow, I didn't realize they were that big physically. So... Uh, that's the part you can't control. You can always look on tape and, and see everything they do, know everything they're trying to run and how they try to take stuff away, and you try to tweak this or that to try to take advantage of some of that stuff. But the game's the game in the end, and, 
and uh, it'll be left in the players' hands. You know, the coaches will do everything they can do, and then the players usually make the coach either look really good or really bad. They do hit a lot of threes. Do they put different type of stress on the defense because they, they're not afraid to throw it? No, they have, uh, they have two extremely good three-point shooters. You know, one of them had made over 100 this year. And uh, so we know we have to get out there and contest the three. And that's how we, our defense has kind of helped us. So that's the run we went on. You know, we've taken away the three-point shot from a lot of teams. You know, and even New Mexico at halftime, they made six threes the first half. And that was the one thing we said, no more threes, no more threes. Don't give them up any more threes. I think we only gave them two in the second half. So the three-point shot is such a weapon that uh, we have to be conscious of where their shooters are and, maybe extend our defense further than we want to at times, but we cannot give up open threes. And I think everybody that's playing this time of the year doesn't give up a lot of open threes. And they're a pretty good rebounding team, considering they really don't have a lot of height size. How are they able to do that? It's width, you know. What they lack in height, they make up for in width. And uh, they've got like four guys I looked at in the stats that have 55 or more offensive rebounds. And so... Uh, their bigs are very physical. They know how to position themselves. They're well coached. You know, they, they pursue the ball. And so we'll be obviously working on boxing out like I'm sure they will be for two days. You know, it's the, it's the free points that you've got to get. You're not going to win games in the half quarter. You're going to get a couple fast break baskets. You know, they're going to want them. We're going to want to limit them. Uh, are you going to get a couple putbacks where you don't draw it up, where we're going to run this play and make this shot every time? You're going to miss shots. So how many offensive rebounds, putbacks are you going to get, both teams? So a couple of those areas that, that don't show up in what you're preparing for, but are going to be instrumental in winning the game. In the four years that Trey has been here, is this right now the best that you've seen him play? Absolutely. He's playing at uh, his peak efficiency right now. And with that being said, I still don't think he's 100% healthy. I mean, I think his health is good, but his conditioning is still working its way there. You know, he's probably up to 90% now. But uh, you think back when the year started with the work he put in and how chiseled he was and the condition he was in, you know, to work himself e anywhere close to that right now is going to be a huge advantage for us. Were you surprised as badly as Kel was lumping around and he took over the game with a lot of late minutes? No, I asked him, and I didn't, when he was limping around, I didn't ask him if he wanted to come out because he was limping. I, I thought maybe he might need a 30 second or a minute blow just from being up and down the floor, more conditioning wise, as much energy he was exerting at that time. So it wasn't the injury, it was more like you need 30 seconds to get a blow leading into the TV timeout. And he said, no, I'm good. And so that's just a trust the coach has with the player. You know, that when he tells me he's good, then I'm expecting he's gonna play at a high efficiency and he did. I believe his uh, great guard play, you know, wins in March. Uh, how confident are you? Yeah, our guard play's been great. That's what won us, you know, the New Mexico game. Devin and Trey making great decisions off high ball screens. And then obviously defensively our guards, led by Jeremy Hemsley and Trey and Devin, you know, trying not to give up baskets to other good guards off screen and rolls or driving situations. So guard play's critical at this time of the year. And like most coaches in the tournament, I'll put it in Trey or Devin's hands and they'll make a play that will win or lose games for us. But uh, I have trust in them and that's why I'll put the ball there. Seems to be playing with a lot more attitude, I guess, you know, than, than he was early in the season. What, what do you attribute that to? You know, Cam just hung in there. He, he came to work every day, and even though his minutes drop, you know, sometimes when your minutes drop, you find a way to sprain an ankle and miss a day or two of practice, and because you know you're not playing. Cam never missed a day, he never missed a rep, came to work every day, and just waited for his chance, knowing he couldn't control that. All he could control was how hard he practiced and what his attitude was. I controlled the minutes. And so when I started him senior night, he was ready for that moment. And I would have been foolish not to continue to play him because he's playing at a really high level. And I will say this, and hopefully in March, and like we've seen it, the games are allowed to get a little bit more physical as much as those, they'll say they're not. And Cam's a physical presence in there. So his body, his, his length, his size has helped us uh, down in the low post in these games over the last uh, two weeks. Brian, the fact that you've got a couple of real leaders, does that offset their No, probably not, Lee. They do such a good job of boxing out that we'll have to find our way to work ourselves around their bodies. You know, they watch tape. They're going to see Jalen running in from the perimeter. So I've got to imagine as good a coach as 
he is and their staff is that he's going to hit a forearm on the way in there and then he's got to either fight his way off it and still pursue the ball or give in. So I think he'll continue to fight around that and Malik will and, and they'll have to fight through contact to be efficient this game. Describe Brock Gray as a player and he scores quite a bit. He's a leading scorer and it seems to be kind of what makes him go. Yeah, he's a dynamic guard. You know, he's, he's great going downhill on the fast break. You give him momentum going forward, he'll, without the size of Hutchinson, but he'll get to the rim on anybody. And then off ball screens, uh, he can shoot behind him. He can shoot the three. He can get in the, in the paint and be crafty and tuck it in and find open people. So like most good teams playing this time of the year, the guard play is good, and, and he's as good as there is out there. Doug, you obviously know about the coaching fraternity. How much will coaches talk to other coaches that have faced with a team like Elk or the team that you're going to face here? I mean, will you talk to other people that have played against them? You know, there's, there's certain conference rules. You're not supposed to give up material on other teams in your conference. But, you know, maybe you might glean some information here or there, not full scouting reports. You might be able to, you know, talk to a friend and just glean a little bit. But not many schools will send full reports on other schools. You know, but the thing is, with this day and age, we'll have absolutely every tape they've played. And then it's up for us to dissect it and say, why are they playing them this way? And, and see some of the subtleties of it. You know, are they trying to send this guy left on the dribble all the time? Are they trying to uh, uh, stay connected to this guy all the time at, at the expense of not playing help side defense? And so some of that stuff you watch. And then, like, even set play-wise, uh, some set plays teams don't run this time of the year because they're so well scouted and they take that play away. And then all of a sudden, you'll see a set play they maybe haven't run for three weeks that everyone's taken away that you don't know about, and they're running it again. You know, so there's stuff you have to look back a ways to see Maybe they'll think, well, we're playing a new opponent. We can go back to this, and they won't be ready for it. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. But you've seen the, uh, I'm sure you've seen the digest in the bracket a little bit. Uh, and I believe only five uh, teams outside the power of six basketball conference, including the Big Nancy that got at Robert Burke in, in the conference. They're adding a couple of upsets in conference uh, tournaments. They would have only been three, which would be all time low. Uh, St. Mary with 28 wins. Didn't get in, didn't kind of steal wins the other one. Both their coaches said, man, the, the, the margin of error is shrinking. I just wonder if you could speak to that. What, what's life as a mid-major like now when you look at the way these brackets are coming up? You know, I think a lot of it comes to scheduling, and the thing that the power five and then you can say six are doing is they're playing more conference games. They're all going up to 20 conference games to try to limit the mid-majors from getting in a non-conference game. You know, lower op our opportunities to play teams like Arizona's or people like that you know so I think you know everybody wants to schedule good people but I know one thing there's no uh, power five school that's going to go up and play St. Mary's in that gym then not that's not going to happen so in a way they're limited St. Mary's opportunities to get there by having great non-conference things and you know it's like anything else it's some of these teams the, the power fives they don't have to be playing at maximum efficiency to start the year because they have so many opportunities in their conference whereas the St. Mary's goes to the Wooden Legacy and they drop two games and then it's lethal for them at the end of the year even though they're one of the best teams in the country. So the, the pressure on the non-Power 5 schools to win non-conference games early to be at your maximum efficiency at the very start of the year is, is growing every year. You know, your opportunities in, in November are so critical that you're like, are we crazy? We have to be playing our best basketball out of the gates and then to play that way all through the season is a lot more pressure on the mid-majors. Is, it, is that why you're seeing a lot of these top mid major programs that put a lot of resources into basketball get into the same conference? You saw it in the Big East with Creighton and Xavier and Butler, and you saw it in the AAC now. With yeah, with Wichita State. State. Yeah, they're trying Possibly to. lead your conference as well. Is, it, is that why they're doing that? that yeah, absolutely. Doing? To build, build more opportunities within your conference. You know, where if you slip up, you might have two or three ranked teams in the conference. You know? So, I mean. You look at us, if we had any chances in at-large, it was beating Nevada Trice, the only ranked team in our conference. You know, and I'm not saying we would have gotten at-large. We most likely wouldn't have. But just to have those opportunities to say, Nevada's going to be good again. You have Gonzaga in here, they're good. You have San Diego State, those are all quality opportunities. New Mexico's getting better. Our conference is getting better, you know. So hopefully if we continue to uh, 
have success in the tournament. And I, I'm so happy that we're a two big league again. And, uh, you know, you, you sit there and you look at the Pac-12, they're only a three big league. So it's, it's year to year. You know, the, the balance of power changes. And, and you think the Pac-12 a year ago had a lot of teams, and this year they're down to three again. Obviously, from just my standpoint, athletically, you know, it's good to have more quality members. You know, there's all sorts of stuff the athletic directors and the presidents have to work through, you know, that, that you know, I'm not privileged or knowledgeable at. But just from a basketball standpoint, the more teams you have that are good in your conference, the more opportunities you have to get quality wins and build the reputation of it. Zach, how hard is it not to want to burn them in? It, it's not as hard. The hardest turnaround, to be honest with you, was like Nevada to New Mexico. You know, we'd only played New Mexico once, and they press all game. You know, they, they play different than anybody else. And so I think probably as a coaching staff, we got a total of maybe two or three hours sleep that night between the game. So in that hour and 15 minutes in the ballroom, the morning of the game, we could walk through a game plan. I mean, we put in a whole new press offense in a walkthrough in an hour and 15 minutes, how we thought we could beat New Mexico's press. An hour and 15 minutes, and the team listened, and they, they, they did it. And then we said, here's how we're going to play this ball screen. And so we might have spent 10, 12 hours that night getting ready for that hour and 15-minute meeting. And then the, to the player's credit, they took that meeting and did everything we asked them to do. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of time that goes into it, but it's necessary. I mean, uh, this is easier. You know, we don't play till Thursday. This is a normal three, four day prep. So this is more time than we've had in a long time to get ready for a game. Anyone else? Brian, one other question. You, since you sat next to Steve for so many years, is there anything that surprised you at this time walking through as a first year coach? Anything to wow? No, not really, Lee. It's just, you know, maybe it's more, you know, I always had great relationships with the players, but this, more, you know, individual meetings with them that Steve used to have. You know, if there was a guy that was down in the dumps or a guy that was, you know, needed a pep talk or just to talk to him about anything, you know, I'm having more of those meetings now than I've had in the past. You know, and that doesn't mean I never had a relationship with the players, but it's just a different relationship. That would probably be the biggest thing that changed this year.